A blessed Sunday to everyone. Please open your Bibles with me in the book of Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 17. We will be delving into the new series entitled Status. It's talking about our status in the Lord Jesus Christ. And for today's sermon, the title is Not Condemned. That's the very first status that you and I will be learning in Christ Jesus. We are no longer condemned. Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 17. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. May the good Lord bless the reading of his word. A few years ago, we took a very young lady to our family. Her task was to take care of my son when he was still very small. And that lady did her job so excellently. We loved her. She took care of our little boy while my wife and I did the ministries here at the church along with the other pastors. We left, sometimes we left them in the home with my mom and sometimes we brought them here in the office. So we enjoyed her presence as she served with us. The problem one day, she told us that she needed to go back home. She came from a remote area in Sambuanga del Sur. She said that her mom asked her several times to be home already. We suspected that she won't be able to come back to us. And so we allowed her. Later, we were informed that the very reason why her mom wanted her to go back home was that she was indebted to someone, to a man, and the amount of money was huge for her that she could no longer pay him. And the arrangement was that that daughter of her who worked with us had to marry that man. And that was the reason why she needed to go back home. All I, I thought before, that could only happen in teleserie or in movies. But that's still happening even in our time today. But what's good about it was that just quite recently, we found out that the man she married was a Christian. And she is now going to church with him as well. So at least it, st it still turned out to be something good despite that scenario. But the mother required her to go home because she needed to pay a price, an amount that she herself could not pay. And that's why she had to obligate her son. In God's dispensation of justice in the divine realm, in every mistake committed, in every offense that is done, there is a corresponding price that has to be paid. And when that amount or the price that is corresponding to the mistake that was committed is so much already and the person who made the offense could not pay for it, that's the moment that the person will be condemned. I'll repeat. In God's dispensation of justice, for every offense, every mistake committed, there is a corresponding consequence that every offender shall pay. But if time comes that the offense could no longer be paid, by the offender, then that person will be condemned. When we look at that scenario, 
every one of us offended God. As the book of Romans chapter 3, 23 would tell us that all have sinned and have fallen short of God's glory. All of us, there is no one that is exempted as far as this God's way of dispensation of His grace and justice. All of us, we have committed before God an offense. And here is the thing. As we look at our offenses, we can at least all of them because there are too plenty of them. And there is no one among us who is capable of paying the offense that we have, we have acquired. No one among us has the capability or the capacity of paying the offense that we have made. And because of that, we are all condemned. This is exactly the thing that Paul was talking about, that even at this moment when Jesus Christ dispensed His grace, Paul continued to struggle about it, that he looked at himself as a person who is wretched. If you look at Romans chapter 7, in verse 24, he mentioned to himself, he described himself as wretched man that I am. Who will set me free from the body of this death? The truth of the matter is that Paul himself acknowledged the reality that he is truly doomed. He is wretched. He is condemned. But the story doesn't end there. Because in the midst of that reality that Paul could not pay for the offense that he committed, in the midst of that reality that you and I committed something before God and that we cannot pay for it, the story doesn't end there. Because if you look at verse 25, Paul said, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. He continued in chapter 8, verse 1, saying, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life is Christ Jesus, has set you free from the law of sin and of death. What is this law of sin that he's talking about? That when man commits something, he must pay the price. We are all obligated we, are, we shall be responsible to pay for the price of the mistakes that we have committed before God. And that's how things work, even in this world today. If you use your credit card to buy something, e may utang ka ngayon, kailangan mo yung bayaran. You are obligated to pay for the amount, the corresponding amount that you have with the item that you got or the service that you acquired. There is always a corresponding amount. And because you used your card, you did not use money, you are now obligated to pay for that amount na inutang natin. Pag hindi natin yun binayaran, then hahabulin ka ngayon ng batas. Because we are obligated to anything that we have incurred. Now, looking at this in the spiritual aspect of life, it's on that same sense. We are all indebted because we have offended the Holy God. And for every offense, there is a corresponding consequence that you and I need to pay. And because we could not pay for it, we are condemned. That was the status of every human being on this planet. Everyone is doomed. Everyone is under condemnation because of the offense that you and I committed. But the story doesn't end there because through the grace of Jesus, He offered Himself at the cross at Calvary as a payment for that thing that you and I cannot pay. He offered Himself, and we, the ones who avail this grace that He is offering, then we are lifted up from the condemnation that is imposed by the sins that we have committed. That is why today, the enemy, the devil, the law doesn't have the power over us. 
the enemy could no longer come into our midst and would tell us, you are still obligated to pay for the penalty of your sins. The enemy doesn't have the power to say that anymore. Why? Jesus paid it all on our behalf already. No wonder. Because Jesus paid it on our behalf, our obligation now is no longer to the consequence of the sins that we committed, but it is now to the Lord Himself. This is what is being said here in the text that we are considering this morning. When you look at verse 12, clearly it says there, So then, brethren, we are under obligation to what? To the penalty of our sins? Not anymore. To what? To the devil who con constantly accuses us of our sins? Not anymore. We are not obligated or under obligation anymore to anything else except to God Himself who has paid the price on our behalf. Now, we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we must always think of this. Our accountability, our obligation is towards God. Yes, it is true that God has given us this salvation for free from our end. But He paid much of its price because it took His very life to pay, to snatch us out of darkness, to lift us up from the condemnation that sin has brought into our lives. He paid it with His very own life. But listen very carefully. Now that we are lifted up from the condemnation of sin, you and I are obligated under the obligation to honor Him. While God is not like a policeman who comes to us and would tell us, I will put you behind bars if you will not do what I say. While God doesn't do that, while God doesn't say, I will withhold my blessing from you because you disobeyed, this from, uh, you disobeyed this particular thing. God doesn't say that. While that reality still happens because God operates with grace as He deals with us, we shall never forget that we have a new obligation and a new responsibility. No longer under the law of sin, but we have the responsibility to live as the Spirit would lead us. And in this passage that we are looking at right now, that obligation that every believer has before God is explained with this work of the Holy Spirit. Let's take note that everyone who avails the work of Christ is now given the Spirit of God residing in our lives day after day so that our obligation to honor God is still through the work of God in the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Imagine that. It was God who paid the price for us. It is God who enables us to do our responsibility before Him. What are these works of the Holy Spirit as exemplified in the text? Let's look at what is mentioned here by Paul. In verse 13, it is clear that it's the Spirit of God who empowers the believers to put to death the work of the flesh. Listen very carefully. Many of us are claiming that we are Christians. We are followers of Jesus. We were lifted up from the condemnation of sin. We are set free by Christ's work at the cross at Calvary. But there are many believers who are not living in freedom. As if we are still indebted to the law of sin. Because as if we are living in a life that is shackled by the powers of darkness. Wake up, brethren. It's time for us to rise up and think and rethink about who we are in Christ. We have been given a new status you and I are no longer under condemnation. We have been set free. We have been lifted up from the condemnation of sin. Then we ought to live our lives under the power or the empowerment of the Holy Spirit of God. Let's live for His glory and honor. 
He empowers you and me to live a life that will honor God. He did not leave us by our own strength because if we rely on our own ability, we will fail. We will commit mistakes again. We will sin before God over and over. But with the work of the Holy Spirit, we are victors in Christ. Always remember that from time to time I would hear people succumbing to sin and they would say, Dahil ako ay tao lamang. That is true. But that shall not be the reason of Christians why we will continue sinning in this life. Why? Yes, it is true that you are merely a human being, but you are not just a man. You are a man that is so precious before God that He died for you, that He gave you His Spirit to empower you to live a life of a victor. You are not a person natalunan. You are a victor in Christ because you have the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God who empowers the believers. Looking at verse 14, it's the Spirit of God who leads the believers in a way of life that is not of the world. A life that is glorifying God. Take note of that. From time to time, we will be led by our conscience or we will be stopped by our conscience to stop doing something that is immoral, that is wrong. But you know what? Your conscience can give you a warning that what you are about to do is wrong. But your conscience doesn't have the power to lead you to do what is right. Your conscience may stop you, giving you an alarm that you are about to lie, something that is not right before the eyes of God. It would remind you that what you are about to do, something is bad. And yet it's only the Spirit of God who can lead you to do what is right. It is the Spirit of God that leads us to take simple steps of faith towards righteousness. It is the Spirit of God that would lead us to stay away from corruption. It is the Spirit of God that would lead us to step back if there is something immoral in front of us. It is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. And there is no reason for Christians to live under condemnation because we have been lifted up and the Spirit of God is keeping our status as intact as it could be. It's the Spirit of God who leads us. Added to that, the Spirit of God doesn't only empower us, the Spirit of God doesn't only lead us, but when you look at verse, verse 15 of the text that we have, it talks about the Spirit as the one who marks the believers. In the spiritual realm, they would recognize if you have the Spirit of God. When God looks at the world, He does not only see the world by itself. He does not only see people, billions of individuals living on the planet. But when God looks at the world, He sees billions of people living on the planet. And He knows who among them are followers of Jesus. You know why? Because each follower of Christ has the mark of God, the very presence of the Holy Spirit living in you. When God looks at the world, He sees you from where you are because you are marked by the Spirit. One time, I think it was Dr. Ira Lee Rosalita who related a story about somebody he knows who was invited to attend a fiesta in a mountain area. This person who happened to be a believer went to that place. And when he arrived there in that house where he is invited to join the celebration, there was a ritual being done inside the house. And while he was there, he was there at the door of the house. And the ritual went on for several minutes and yet it did not end. So that man who was a believer was waiting right at the door for so long already. But the ritual didn't end that very soon. And the one who was officiating a ritual of somewhat like an occult in the house 
whispered to the owner of the house, Who is that standing on the door? And the owner of the house said, He is my friend. And you know what the leader told him? Kindly tell him to stay away from the door because the spirit that we are invoking here cannot go out because the spirit is afraid of him. Why is that spirit afraid of that guy? Because the Holy Spirit of God lives in the life of that person. So if you look at it from the spiritual realm, the spiritual forces will see the reality of the Spirit's presence in a person's life. In the spiritual realm, when you go to a place where darkness is present, they would know if you have the Spirit of God. That's why it's so important for us to know this. The Spirit of God lives in you because He serves as the mark of those who have faith in Jesus. Not only that the Spirit empowers, leads, and marks the believers, but the Spirit testifies and affirms deep within our hearts that we belong to God. You know why is this so important? From time to time, even believers may commit a mistake. Even Christians may commit a sin again. But it is so wonderful to think that our God is a forgiving God. When we commit a mistake, you know what's the theological standpoint that I take for a sinning Christian? It's so simple. We go back to the gospel account when a woman who was caught in adultery was brought to Jesus, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the society was willing to condemn her to death. And Jesus, what did he do? He make, made a mark on the floor or on the ground. And he said, whoever among you who did not commit anything will be the one to first to throw a stone first, I mean, to this lady. And nobody did because everyone was feeling guilty about sin. And this is what Jesus told to that woman. Jesus said, Lady, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. From theological standpoint, it is clear that when we ask for forgiveness, Jesus would dispense forgiveness right away with a condition that we shall be willing to live that sinful life that we have. That's so simple for us who receive it, but for him it's not because he paid for it at the cross at Calvary. But whenever a Christian would sin, you know what happens? The enemy will come and will again condemn us because of what we did. That's what the enemy does. He will come to us again and would tell us, I told you, di ragyud ka magbago. Dalo, dalo ragyud gihapon ka. If you committed something immoral, the enemy would come to you and tell you, it's useless that you call on Jesus if you keep on living in sin. Well, he's right after all, but not all right in his statement because it's not useless. He brings back the condemnation where we had before. He brings it back for us to think that we do not belong to God. But when in your heart and mind it is deeply rooted that the Spirit is testifying deep within you and is telling you, you belong to God, that's why I am here living in you. When we commit a mistake, we feel guilty about it, right? And yet Jesus would tell us, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. The enemy will come and say no. You will never be better. You will sin over and over again. The enemy would come, ah, bakakon yud gihapun ka. The enemy would come and tell you, sinungaling ka pa rin. The enemy would come and will continue to condemn us. But so long that the Spirit of God is there, is the Spirit of God who would tell you, do not believe in the lies of the enemy. The fact that I am in you, you belong to God. My friends, if we think about that truth 
And if someone would sin within our family, within the church, may we find ourselves reminding that person of his obligation towards God rather than condemning the person. The problem sometimes is that condemnation wouldn't even come directly from the enemy. There are times that condemnation would come through a fellow believer. And there are many Christians who stop coming to church already because when they come to church, sila ray ginalantaw. Especially when their sin has been made public. There are times that believers, we ourselves become very condemning about the mistake of others. But that's not how God desires for us to be. Because if we think about our status, it is only by the grace of God that we have been lifted from the power of sin and condemnation. Who are we to condemn others? We shall look at mistakes of our fellow believers from the perspective of restoration. It's my prayer that when someone commits a mistake within the church, number one, that person will be sorry for the sins that he committed and will be willing to live his sinful life. Iba naman yung nagsosori lang pero hindi willing iwanan yung kasalanan. Parang niloloko lang natin ang Diyos on that matter. What did God say? Your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. So if we say sorry to God, we must have the willingness in our hearts to live our sinful acts. Because once we come to Jesus, He will be in the position to change us and to conform us into his likeness with the work of the Holy Spirit. As I have told you, the Spirit of God is there in our lives, empowering us to live a life of a victor day by day. The Spirit of God is there leading us to do what is right, pleasing to God day after day. The Spirit of God is there in our midst, marking us in the spiritual realm the spirits and God himself would see that we belong to God because the spirit is residing in us. And lastly, the spirit of God testifies deep within our hearts that we belong to him. Even if we commit mistakes, we still belong to him. That's why when we commit mistakes, if we truly belong to God, we will come to God and say, sorry, Lord. Because if you do not belong to God, and you commit a mistake, usually, hindi lumalapit kay Lord, lumalayo kay Lord. Because the person who has the Spirit of God will feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit to come back to the Lord and say, sorry, I will live my sinful life. But a person who does not have the Spirit of God will feel again the condemnation and that person will go away from God. The conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. The condemnation comes from the enemy. And that's the difference. A conviction would lead to forgiveness because the person would ask for forgiveness. But condemnation would lead to hatred and further sin. The conviction that the Spirit will do in the person's life would make the person return to Jesus availing His grace. But the person who is condemned runs from God in shame. The person who is convicted by the Holy Spirit will experience the joy that would be coming out of the forgiveness of sins and the peace and the freedom that comes through Christ. But the person who is condemned brings more sin and regret in his life. When a believer sins so long that the Spirit is living and is convicting us, we are safe because the presence of the Spirit Himself would tell us that we belong to God. So, from the very beginning, I have said that Jesus paid the price on our behalf, that price that you and I could not pay. Because He paid for that price, we are lifted up from the condemnation of sin. 
So our obligation this time is no longer toward the sins that we committed, but our obligation is toward the God who gave us salvation. And our accountability is towards Him to live our lives with the Holy Spirit residing in us. And the Spirit of God plays a huge role that you and I will be able to do what God desires for us to do. That's why do not forget that we worship a triune God. Oftentimes, we only remember the Father who becomes the very recipient of our prayer request. And we pray through the Lord Jesus Christ, we say in Jesus' name. But we often forget that there is the Holy Spirit who is leading us and helping us day after day. Francis Chan wrote a book, a theology book, that is entitled The Forgotten God. Because this is a reality that in many churches you can find today, there are few believers who are constantly conscious of the presence of the Spirit of God in their lives. But for us here, I am praying that with this truth of the gospel that is preached to us, we will be constantly aware that we are no longer condemned and we can live a life that is not condemned only with the work of the Spirit that resides in us. The Spirit empowers, the Spirit leads, the Spirit marks us that we belong to God, and the Spirit testifies deep within our soul that we belong to God. May we all live victoriously because we have a life that is no longer condemned. Good morning, everyone, and the Lord bless us all.